Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the Senate Environmental Natural Resource mm -hmm. Finance Committee, Wednesday, March 9th, 2022. We got rather robust uh, uh, agenda today, so uh, we're going to get started right away if we can. We do have a quorum, may it be, may it be noted. Um, most all but one of these bills will actually be held over, um, so we'll be taking a vote and sending, uh, if if the uh, committee so chooses, to the uh, state government, which would be the uh, Senate File 33, or excuse me, 3667. But today, we're going to start out with Senator Rood, Senate File 2769, Tourism Industry Recovery Grant Program Appropriation. I see you have a crowd of testifiers. <laughs> Welcome, well, I should say welcome to the vice chair. Do I do have to say welcome to the vice chair? Yes, you do, sir. <laughs> All right, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, we're gonna hand out, the new cereal boxes are here for the year. And okay. so um, they're, it's really exciting that, that we have them for this hearing. And um, I think they look great today. Yeah. yeah, aren't they cute? And they have a little Bemidji plaid on the top. All right, nice. So, yeah, Mr. Chair and committee, today we have Senate File uh, 2769, the Tourism Industry Recovery Grant Program Appropriation. Um, and I have um, quite a few people uh, to testify today, so I'm going to just bring them right up to the table so that we can, um, I know you have a long agenda. Um, you know that the um, tourism industry has really uh, struggled, uh, but they are working very hard uh, to bring this industry back. Uh, and this uh, bill would appropriate $6 million in fiscal year 2023. And with me today, I have um, first, um, Ms. Pisick, you're going to be up first. Pisick. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Sarah Pisick. I represent the Minnesota Tourism Growth Coalition, a statewide group of public, private, and nonprofit tourism organizations and businesses. I want to thank Senator Rood and the bill co-authors, many of who are on this committee, for sponsoring Senate File 2769. The tourism and hospitality industry was the first sector shut down at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, and while there has been some recovery in the industry, that recovery has not been consistent. There have been multiple starts and stops. Recovery is not even across the state or across tourism sectors, and full recovery will take several years. We know that the success of the tourism and hospitality industry plays a strong role in the su success of a community. Local, regional, and state taxes provide support for community services, and increased tourism activity benefits local bars, restaurants, gas stations, grocery stores, theaters, event planners, stage crews, printing shops, outdoor recreation providers, and many more businesses. On the Explore Minnesota cereal boxes that you just received, you'll see information about how the industry has suffered economically during the pandemic. And there's also information broken down by county on the back of the box. Information from Explore Minnesota shows that Minnesota's tourism industry has suffered nearly $12 billion in travel spending losses since 2019. Leisure and hospitality gross sales fell from $16.6 billion in 2019 to $11.7 billion in 2020. State sales tax collections fell from $1.1 billion in 2019 to $731 million in 2020. And jobs in these categories are down approximately 70,000 workers. The bill under consideration today, Senate File 2769, will direct $6 million in one-time funding to a tourism industry recovery grant program. The grant program will flow through Explore Minnesota with 100% of the funds going directly toward accelerating tourism recovery. The grants will be used to support meetings, conventions, and group business, multi-community and high visibility events, and tourism marketing. It's important to note that no other state agencies are serving the needs of Minnesota's destination marketing organizations, event organizers, or the meeting industry with a grant recovery program like this request. And this also does not overlap with any existing Explore Minnesota tourism programs. In 2021, the legislature appropriated $750,000 for a tourism recovery grant program, and thank you for that. 
Explore Minnesota reports that those funds were consumed within eight hours of opening the application period. So clearly there is a need for this bill today. The bill is also supported by the Minnesota Association of Convention and Visitors Bureaus, the Community of Minnesota Resorts, Hospitality Minnesota, as well as hundreds of individual tourism and hospitality businesses and organizations across the state. I will now turn things over to testifiers who will share a perspective on tourism recovery from different points of view and will all be available to answer questions. Sure, and members, I think we'll hold our questions till after the test, all the testifiers. Thank you. Welcome. I think next we're gonna go to um, Mike Schweiders from Boyd Lodge who is joining Rachel. us remo remotely. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Senators. My name is Mike Schweiders. I'm from Boyd Lodge up in Cross Lake, Minnesota. And I apologize for not being able to be there in person today. Uh, as I am also the president of the community of Minnesota Resorts, and we were doing our day on the hill yesterday and today via Zooms, so I jumped out of that, and some of you I've already seen and I will see later. Um, as I said, I represent the community of Minnesota Resorts. We are mostly uh, made up of mom and pop resorts throughout the state of Minnesota. We have approximately 150 current members, and I'd like to, you know, we as a group ourselves, probably fared the best out of all of the tourism sectors in the state of Minnesota. Um, however, even within our areas, that is not consistent or uniform. Uh, I'm in the Cross Lake area, Brainerd Lakes area. Uh, we did, we had a pretty good year last year. However, my colleagues that have the bigger resorts that lie on the, the um, uh, corporate events, uh, the larger event type things, uh, any kind of music venue events, all of those type of things that gather bigger groups of people together, they are struggling uh, and they have continued to struggle. We have not seen the bounce back that we did where we have individual families coming back and forth. And so that's where I truly ask for your support on this bill because this generally will go out to those type of uh, sectors uh, like the St. Cloud area, the St. Paul, Minneapolis areas, the hotels in those areas have struggled and are continuing to, they have not seen the bounce back. The, the other challenge that we're starting to see already is if you've watched news lately, uh, Wisconsin Dells is inundating our airwaves with, you know, come visit us, come visit us. And even the Dakotas are starting to get their, their message out. And so that's where, what we're, we're fighting with that as well, not just pandemic, but now that these outside markets are starting to realize that the travelers are looking to get out and, and go and do some uh, things that maybe they haven't done in the last, you know, probably two plus years. And so this is where Explore Minnesota does such an amazing job uh, of being able to reach out to some of that out state, you know, the Iowa's, the Dakotas, um, Illinois, Wisconsin, and bringing new dollars into the state of Minnesota. I know, uh, as we were talking with some uh, representatives earlier today, when they come up to stay in a small resort like ours, uh, they are not just staying there. They're going out and spending money in the restaurants and bars, as Sarah said earlier. They're spending money at the local bait shops, at the gift shops. They're buying ice cream at the local vendors. All of those places rely on bringing tourism and tourists into our communities. So with that, um, I, again, I appreciate you taking time to hear me today, and I thank you for the opportunity. I look for your support on this very, very important piece of legislation. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And who do we have next? Mr. Chair, I believe we have um, Rachel Thompson from Visit Greater St. Cloud, and she is also virtual today. Ms. Thompson, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rachel Thompson, and I'm on the Board of Directors of the Minnesota Association of Convention and Visitors Bureaus, as well as the Executive Director of Visit Greater St. Cloud. That is the destination management and marketing organization for the cities of St. Cloud, Wake Park, and the surrounding central Minnesota um, region. I'm here fully supporting the Minnesota Senate file 4769. It is imperative to destination management organizations like mine and the communities that we represent to get this appropriation. These recovery dollars directly impact the hospitality sector that went and got hit the hardest in the last two years. As of January 27, 2022, U.S. Travel Association reported that the Minnesota tourism industry had suffered nearly $12 billion 
in travel spend loss since 2019. Those losses are not going to be recovered without substantial support from entities like Explore Minnesota and these appropriations. Individual CVB budgets are largely tied to hotel motel lodging tax and those have been severely impacted due to the decrease in travel and tourism through the pandemic and its ongoing impacts to the travel industry. Visit Greater St. Cloud operated at a 28.4% decrease budget in 2021 and is still projected to be 28% down in revenues in 2022 compared to that 2019 level. That is better than the 53.2% decrease that we had in 2020 from lodging collections, but it still has not made enough of an advancement. The market is ready and we need to have those dollars to be able to go out and get that business. The one-time recovery grant that you all gave um, before greatly impacted what we were able to do and attributed to the past um, advances in our industry. Um, we thank you greatly for that. In that last recovery appropriation, you have heard that it was used within eight hours. Something that's really key to note of that is it opened at midnight. And so we all as destination management organizations set alarms to wake up to receive those dollars because they are so vital to the recovery of our industry. EMT is prepared to alter those start times to more like an 8 a.m. on an uh, opening, um, but it does demonstrate a clear need and a clear um, responsibility of getting those funds from our organizations because we were willing to do that and really um, was imperative to the success of our, our communities. There's still clearly a great need in the tourism industry and these grant funds allow for destinations to execute placements, target niche markets, win event contracts, fulfill marketing plans necessary for travel in their area, and for every dollar invested in Minnesota tourism marketing, it returns an estimated $180 spent in travel, as well as $18 in state and local taxes. We all know those additional taxes raised help to residually impact our communities. Visit Greater St. Cloud was very fortunate and received $20,000 in the last recovery grant program. Of those funds, we were able to receive over 500,000 impressions on banner ad placed during travel and outdoor seasonal activities, run an ad in Minnesota Travel e-newsletter for February and May, and contract a local video and photography company for nine months, which included six videos, 12 short social format videos, along with photos from each of the 30 attractions visited in those segments. Those new assets are invaluable as they're the first thing that potential travelers see when they're looking to make a travel decision. They're getting inspiration and they're really um, finding that awe again to visit Minnesota. It was extremely important that we receive those funds because we would have never been able to with the current budget afford any of those items. This Explore Minnesota recovery grant program funded with the appropriation would aid in bringing these financial tax collection gaps and provide a recovery source directly for the promotion and support of tourism in all of our great Minnesota destinations. It is my recommendation and my true plea to move Senate File 2769 forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, we just have one more testifier. Um, we have um, from Visit Roseville, Judy Wearn. Good morning, thank you. Welcome Good morning, to the Mr. Committee. Chair. Thank you, members. My name is Julie Wern. I am president and CEO of Visit Roseville. We consider ourselves perfectly positioned in the Twin Cities area between Minneapolis and St. Paul. And before I start my testimony, I'm going to tell you a very exciting thing that happened to us last week at the Explore Minnesota Tourism Conference. We were awarded the Marketing Campaign of the Year for Roseville in Bloom, which took place in 2020. We were going to start it in um, June of 2020, and then we kicked it back to July, thinking COVID would be done by then. And then, of course, we turned it from a, bringing visitors in to a COVID-friendly promotion in the Twin Cities area for everyone, because it was all the roses were outside. You could drive to them. You could walk out in, in the fresh air. I mean, it was a totally COVID-safe environment. And now this year, we're going to start it bringing in, promoting it for tourists, so that because all the statues are still up. But I'm also um, on the board of the Minnesota Association of Convention and Visitors Bureau, and I chair the Education Committee. I'm here today to ask you to support Senate File 2769, passed through $6 million Tourism Recovery Grant Program. Thank you, Senator Rood and the co-authors of this bill. 
As a destination marketing organization in the Twin Cities, I know firsthand how devastating the past two years have been on the metro area. Minnesota was and still is deeply impacted by the global pandemic. The pain is widespread. The comeback curve swings widely depending on where you are in Minnesota. The situation in the Minnesota St. Paul market remains desperate. Typically 70% of Minnesota's overall tourism sales are generated from the metro area. Those revenues remain down by half or more. I'll share with you specific Roseville examples. Our occupancy in 2019 was 70% with an average rate of $102. In 2020, we ended the year at 39% with an average rate of $81. In 2021, that figure leapt, and I never thought I would ever say, be glad to say this, to 49% with a $94 average rate. TPI Hospitality owns and operates 39 hotels in Minnesota, and 28 of those are in the Twin Cities area. We have five in Roseville. Gina Miller, Regional Director of Sales, told me that corporate travel in some markets is coming back, but not in Roseville, which is the toughest market of all, out of all TPI markets. The big corporate players are not traveling to pre-COVID numbers, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, Veritas, and Lando Lakes, to name a few. Most of their travel is still essential travel only. Sporting and leisure continues to stay strong and grow. Typically, Ramsey County Tourism generates $2.3 billion in sales and directly supports 30,000 jobs. Terry Matson, President and CEO of Visit St. Paul, has noted that in the immediate St. Paul area, they have lost more than $1 billion in sales and $70 million in related tax revenues and anywhere from 15 to 20,000 jobs. The dramatic loss of hotel revenues has devastated funding sources for destination marketing organizations. Our funding dropped by almost 70% during this time, and we were forced to make massive budget cuts and lay employees off. All destinations need this grant program to attract new meetings, conventions, and events. We need to attract visitors across multiple segments who access our resources and media to plan their travel, from online to print to social media and digital influencers. In a direct quote from Gina at TPI Hospitality, Minneapolis needs the tourism grant. We need to get positive exposure out there to the consumer. I know that many people we are talking to have concerns of what the environment is like in Minneapolis. We need to find a way to showcase it the way it should be. While travelers expressing plans to resume traveling this year is increasing, the return to normal travel is still elusive. Our destination marketing organizations in Minnesota are in the best position to reach travelers, but also in the worst because of seriously depleted finances. Our metro cities, our state, will not recover without tourism, and tourism will not recover without Visit Roseville and every other destination marketing organization out there promoting travel. The latest blow to our economy might also be a silver lining. According to Longwoods International, a leading and respected market research firm within the travel and tourism industry, the travel recovery we all have hoped for this year faces a new challenge, the quickly rising cost of both gasoline and jet fuel. After two long years of pandemic isolation and restrictions, the last thing consumers need is this oil price shock. This increased expense might not only limit the number of trips travelers take, but also lead to selecting destinations closest to home. As primary drivers of tourism's economic benefits, we need to be in the best position to attract visitors as soon as possible. I need your help, and so do leaders in other communities. Have the stakes have never been higher than they are right now for the long-term health of our economy. We can return better and stronger with your help. Getting visitors moving again safely will in turn get the Metro moving again. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Rood, and others. I encourage you to enthusiastically support this critical bill. Thank you very much to the, uh, to the testifiers. Members, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rood, for bringing this forward and allowing me to be a co-sponsor on it. Um, as you've heard today, and I think was highlighted very well that, you know, our tourism industry took a big hit regardless of what people think during COVID and lockdowns and mandates and that kind of thing. I think a lot of people think that the tourism industry, our resorts still did well, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, as I'm looking at these neat cereal boxes we get, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how much 
one dollar really brings back for the state and why this is such a good investment. Uh, the, it says for every one dollar invested, it brings back one hundred and eighty dollars in spending on six million. That'd be one billion, or just over a billion, and it would generate over one hundred and eight million in additional tax revenue for the state. So this, I think, is a, a very good value for the state, and I think it's very timely. Uh, considering what we're going through with higher gas prices and stuff that, you know, we, we can really highlight that Minnesota really is a good value uh, for tourism, not only for people that live here, but from our neighbors as well. So thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thanks. Members, any other questions? Well, it's certainly some compelling testimony here. There's no question about that. My question that I have is you talk about the, some of the recovery dollars you had did you, in fact, get any recovery dollars from the federal government at all? Yeah, I received a um, $150,000 idle loan, and then we took advantage of the PPP, the Payroll Protection Plan, and then our city um, gave us a, a, a grant funding for money that they received from the government. So that was a true blessing for okay. us in the industry. But the, but the tourism industry itself did not receive anything, sir? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Sarah Pasek, I you asked me that question yesterday, so I checked in with Explore Minnesota, and they did not receive, they're uh, available, the director, Lauren Bennett McGinty, is available on the Zoom to answer that directly. Um, they received no ARP dollars to Explore Minnesota, and none of the federal dollars that the state received flowed through to, um, in the way that these grants do, to individual destination marketing organizations. but. I think if you want to have Lauren respond to that as well from Explore Minnesota, she should be available to answer that. Ms. Painter? Bennett McGinty. Yes, um, Lauren I, Bennett McGinty, Director of Explore sorry. Minnesota Tourism. Yes, we did receive EDA funding, um, approximately $4 million, just over $4 million for that, and that money was used um, to do some research projects, specifically at our welcome centers and um, strategic planning. And then the bulk of it was actually used to invest in out-of-state marketing. Any grants that we gave out in um, the most recent grant program, so our 2022 grant program was a million dollars. And then the crisis grant program, one of them was the 700 um, 50,000 tourism recovery grant, and then the two crisis ones were just over a million. So we gave um, over $2 million from our general fund to um, folks in the industry, but we did not receive any additional funding beyond that. So, th so those were state funds then did you receive, EDA? Yes, those were just part of the Explore Minnesota budget. Right. So we used our own money um, to fund those grants, and with the exception, of course, of that tourism recovery grant that um, Sarah mentioned previously for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, members, if there's no other questions, I I just uh, find it kind of interesting the uh, governor had the opportunity and was given the authority to spend a lot of money, and uh, uh, his administration did when it came to the uh, pandemic, and and uh, um, no dollars came to the tourism recovery because uh, knowing that they were going to definitely have trouble. Um, uh, it's really unfortunate, but uh, nevertheless, we have to move on, and, and uh, uh, the dollars invested certainly have a good return. And, and uh, um, you know, as you know, this will be held over for possible inclusion. But Senator Rood, to your fi any final comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for all the members that signed on and support this bill. And I think you, we've clearly demonstrated the need um, for all of Minnesota, um, greater Minnesota, the metro area, the whole state is in need of these dollars. And I think, um, as uh, Visit Roseville pointed out, the gas prices will probably impact us and what we, and what we uh, spend our dollars on. So it's very important to get this money out into the field as soon as we can so that we can capture those uh, dollars. For our state. So very good. thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Uh, Senate file 2769 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Senator Eichhorn. Senate file 3509. We're going to talk about 404 permitting under the uh, Clean Water Act. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the invite. All right, so we have Senate File 3509. I'd like to thank my co-sponsors, Senator Matthews Bach and Thomasoni. 
Um, what Senate File 3509 would do is uh, direct the state to finalize application materials for Minnesota's assumption of 404 permitting. It would direct 740,000 in fiscal year 23 from the general fund to the Board of Soil and Water Resources to develop and assemble the material required for the state to assume the section 404 permitting. It would re require a report to the legislature when that's done. Uh, Minnesota has been exploring and studying the assumption of permitting authority under section 404 for many years. Oh. Thank you. The action would result in more streamlined permitting process that maintains all of the current environmental protections. In 2019, the legislature uh, uh, required state agencies to develop a report on the framework for the assumption and the cost estimates. The report submitted to the legislature last month and the assumption should benefit Minnesotans. Uh, 3509 follows the report's recommendations by funding the development of materials necessary to submit the application. And with that, we have two testifiers to provide the committee with more information about the report and the next steps moving forward. Okay, if you could have them come forward or are they online? Um, let's see here. I think they might be. I see we have the uh, St. Louis Public uh, Works Environmental Project Manager, Carol Andrews. Is she here? Correct. I'm here. Would you like there to you go are. first, or would Les Lem like to go first? Uh, either one works for me, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, I think I will leave my video off. I was having some um, audio issues here this morning, so if it's all right with you, I'll just uh, uh, go through a little presentation. I'll share my screen here with you. Yeah. That, just go. Uh, my name. That's fine. Yeah, go ahead and identify yourself and who you're with, and uh, please proceed. Um, my name is Les Lem. I am the wetlands section manager for the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Um, I'm trying to get my screen to share here. Are you able to see my screen, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members? Oh, we can see something, but there's n nothing. <laughs> hmm. That made a lot of sense. <laughs> Let's see. It says um, we can now see the screen, but there is nothing there, at least in mine. Interesting. Right, you know, well, let me see what I can see here. Is it something on our end, or is it? Um, I. I I don't know. I was having some audio issues this morning, and I, when I reconnected, that was solved. But um, I don't know if there's something with the Zoom. Um. Last one thing. Sorry, this is Carol, but it was showing, I think, your screen with the video. Do you, if you have two screens going, there you go. Now we have something. There you are. Go ahead. I see a view that we're all looking forward to looking at, which is cattails, water, and green. That's what I have. Mr. Lem, did you lose us? Mr. Chair, yeah. we have somebody here from Bowser that said he's able to give the presentation orally if we're having technical issues here. Very good. So let's let's do that. For, for some reason it's muting me when I when I share my screen. So Okay. So Director is um, is here. Would you like him to com continue or do you want to go ahead, uh, Mr. Lamb? Um, we can try one more time here. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. And can you see my screen now? Yes. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um, did the same thing that I did the first time, but we will, uh, if this works, we'll keep going then. Um, so 
let's hold, let's keep our fingers crossed here. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to, to speak with you today. I, I just give a brief uh, overview of uh, what's known as 404 assumption and the conclusions of a recent report on the funding estimates. Uh, so I'll just start with a little context. So the primary federal and state water regulatory authorities in Minnesota that regulate activities in lakes, streams, and wetlands. Uh, we have the Federal Clean Water Act, Section 404, and that is implemented by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with oversight from the Environmental Protection Agency. On the state side, we also have the State Wetland Conservation Act. Uh, the rules are promulgated by the Minnesota Board of Water and Solar Resources with implementation primarily occurring through local governments. We have the State Public Waters Work Permit Program and the Permit to Mine programs implemented by the Department of Natural Resources. The Public Waters Work Permit Program um, applies to lakes, rivers, streams, and certain wetlands, and the Permit to Mine Program implements the Wetland Conservation Act for mining projects. And there are state water quality standards that are implemented by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So that brings us to 404 assumption. And what is 404 assumption? Well, the Federal Clean Water Act, Section 404, allows for state implementation of an equivalent program which eliminates separate federal permits in most waters. In order to do that, the state has to demonstrate that it has adequate jurisdiction, that its regulations are at least equivalent to the federal regulations, that it has the legal authority and staff and capacity to implement the program, adequate authority to enforce the program in compliance with certain standards and procedural requirements um, that are listed in federal law. So essentially you have a separate state regulatory program and a separate overlapping federal regulatory program, uh, but there are gaps between the two. So um, you fill those gaps and end up with one comprehensive state program and one permit rather than two separate permits and two partially overlapping programs. So why is Minnesota considering assumption? Well, those that are interested in assumption have cited uh, several reasons, including improved permitting timelines and faster processing uh, due to dealing with you know, local and state governments rather than the federal government. Uh, reduced regulatory duplication and redundancy because there's one a comprehensive program as, as opposed to you know, separate state and federal programs. More responsive regulatory authorities because landowners are dealing with local and state staff versus federal. Um, reduced costs for permit applicants uh, due to a more efficient process. And more effective resource management that draws on localized expertise and better incorporation of watershed planning. And just an example of that watershed planning is um, the federal regulations require that a watershed approach be used for implementing mitigation. And the state of Minnesota has invested a significant amount in, um, in watershed planning at the state and local level. And 404 assumption would allow uh, the state to basically implement those state and federal regulations consistent with uh, those watershed planning efforts and target that mitigation to better meet the goals of those local watershed plans. And finally, it's congressional policy that the states implement the Section 404 permitting program. Um, it's included in uh, federal law. So that brings us to uh, the recent report that was uh, mentioned. Uh, the legislation was passed in 2019 and amended in 2021, providing funding to the Environmental Quality Board to begin to develop and assemble the material to assume 404 and to submit the report to the legislature on the funding needed to secure 404 assumption and to fully implement the state assumed program. Um, the, the legislation also uh, was clear that the Environmental Quality Board can execute contracts or interagency agreements to facilitate that work. Uh, if you've noticed at the beginning slide there, the, the Environmental Quality Board is not one of those agencies that has responsibility for implementing um, water regulations in Minnesota. So they entered into an agreement to the EQB with the Board of Water and Solar Resources. Um, Bowser then entered into separate agreements with the Department of Natural Resources and the Pollution Control Agency to facilitate this work. Uh, so we've made, it, it's a pretty uh, complex and significant uh, you know, undertaking. 
um, but you know, we did make pretty substantial progress on a lot of program development issues. Uh, one of those is the Wetland Conservation Act implementation model, as we talked mentioned earlier. Um, it's a state law that's primarily implemented by local governments. That's a pretty substantial state and local partnership that we think is, um, you know, really important to the success of that law, and and it's worked very well. Um, but the state or the federal regulations for assumption require that a state assume the program and have that permitting authority. So we work very closely with the Environmental Protection Agency to develop a, an implementation model for the Wetland Conservation Act that would allow for the, the state issuance of permits but would still continue to utilize um, local governments for reviewing and approving the vast majority of the activities happening out there in wetlands. So that was a pretty significant uh, um, accomplishment um, that really affected our funding estimates. Um, we were, we uh, identified those gaps in jurisdiction. For the most part, the state has greater authority and jurisdiction over waters and wetlands than the federal government does. But there were a couple um, specific gaps that we identified, <clears throat> and we've also identified the mechanism by which those, those resources would, would be regulated under assumption. I mentioned the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and their responsibility for water quality standards. And one, one way that that currently happens is that the MPCA reviews federal permits under 404 to ensure that they meet, that those activities meet state water quality standards. So we developed a process by which um, the, the MPCA would coordinate with Bowser and the DNR on the implementation of um, the Wetland Conservation Act and the D DNR programs, public large permit program, et cetera, um, to ensure that those water quality standards are met. Uh, we did have some prior cost estimates. There was a 2017 feasibility study um, that had some initial cost estimates in it. And those cost estimates for the, the Board of Water and Soil Resources and the Wetland Conservation Act implementation were reduced um, substantially from those prior estimates due to some of the processes that we developed and that and that Wetland Conservation Act implementation model. Um, we also have uh, explored ways to accomplish many of the required administrative tasks through online permitting systems. And that would not that would be a benefit to the state and to local governments even outside of 404 assumption. Right now there's a lot of time spent um, manually with the Wetland Conservation Act um, specifically, um, manually processing applications and noticing, et cetera. And a lot of that work could, could be done um, through an online permitting system, which would, be, uh, would, which would improve efficiency. Um, we've also made significant progress on the process for which we would have to screen for potential impacts to threatened and endangered species and historic properties. Uh, that's actually, even since the report has, um, has been issued, we've, we've been working with the Environmental Protection Agency on that and making um, continued progress. Uh, so that brings us to the conclusions of the report. So based on the information that we have available to us right now, um, these are the, the, the cost estimates, the additional annual funding that would be required to implement the, uh, the assumed program, and this would this would include um, all the necessary staff to uh, to implement to fully and, and, and adequately uh, implement the additional federal requirements, um, the additional expanded jurisdiction, some of that threatened and endangered species review, um, etc. So these estimates are based on the information that we currently have available. We fully expect that if we continue this process, we'll continue to refine these estimates. Um, the more we uh, develop what the program would look like and work closely with uh, the EPA um, to, to, um, to figure out some of the specifics and the details of the program, the more confidence we have in our estimates. Um, so the, the, the Bowser estimate does also include additional funding for local governments um, because we, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, the local governments would still continue to be implementing the majority, vast majority of uh, of the Wetland Conservation Act permitting process. So um, these, uh, the, the, the Bowser estimate has also been reduced, as I mentioned, because of the, 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 the uh, process we worked out with the Environmental Protection Agency. 
Um, there are some additional one-time costs. So I mentioned the, uh, the, per the electronic permitting systems. Right now, there is not an online permitting system for the Wetland Conservation Act. So that would have to be developed um, from scratch. So we have an estimated cost of about 1.5 million for that. We also, uh, the, the Department of Natural Resources does have a permitting system in place, um, MPARS, and, but that permitting system would need to be, uh, some modifications would need to be done to that permitting system. So there's some costs associated with that. And there's also um, some programmatic changes uh, and the application process, the application to EPA. So there are some costs associated with that for amending state statutes and rules and finalizing some agreements with agencies. Um, there's, you know, be some workload associated with the formal application process and as well as some training and outreach. Um, those costs, we don't have a, a good handle on right now. So they would be determined later um, after we, we, we develop the more specific um, statutes and rule uh, re amendments that would be required. Um, and have uh, a little better picture as to where we're at at that point. So the steps in the timeline for potential 404 assumption. So the step that we just completed was the legislative report on funding estimates. So where we're at right now is, um, you know, the potential appropriation for uh, additional funds to finish assembling the remaining materials. And if that happens, um, we would complete the the, pro the agencies would complete the program development work, assemble the draft application materials. Um, develop this, the specific statute changes, have final cost estimates provided to the legislature. And then at that point, the legislature would have the full package, the final cost estimates, and that's when the decision would be made as to whether the state would, would uh, move forward with the application to assume. Um, if that would happen, there'd be the enactment of statute changes, uh, funds appropriated for the, um, for the implementation of the program, some agency rulemaking policy development, submit the application to EPA, and then after approval by EPA, um, implement the, the assumed program. Uh, so that brings us to the additional funding necessary to finish this process of uh, developing the program and, and assembling the application materials. Um, these are one-time funds um, in thousands, and we're looking at uh, approximately a total of about 740,000. That includes uh, the $580,000 for, for the Board of Water and Solar Resources includes um, a full-time project coordinator that would also do work for the Department of Natural Resources and the Pollution Control Agency. So that's why the funds there for Bowser are higher than the other two agencies. Um, and we would expect that this, uh, this work would occur over at least the following biennium. Um, and that's just a brief overview of, uh, of 404 assumption and the conclusions of the recent report. Uh, if you have any, um, any questions, um, we'd be happy to answer them now. Otherwise, uh, you could contact uh, Executive Director Jasky or myself if you want additional information. You have a screen there. Do you see any questions? That, that, that that, are there any questions of Mr. Lamb? Members? I'm not seeing any any questions. So the, I would suggest that they do that. In fact, if they have questions, uh, they could go offline uh, with the director or yourself. And and uh, but it was pretty pretty clear. I mean, it was a good it was a good presentation. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. If there's any if there's any other questions, do you have any other testifiers, uh, um, Senator Eichhorn? Mr. Chair, um, uh, St. Louis County Public Works person. Okay. Carol Andrews. Carol, you were there earlier. Go ahead. Identify yourself, yeah. please. Sorry, little... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please identify thank yourself and, and, move, and go ahead. We're a little short on time, so if you can be brief, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, will do. My name is Carol Andrews. I'm the environmental engineer with St. Louis County Public Works Department. I'm making brief comments today on behalf of three county associations, the County Engineers Association, Association of Minnesota Counties, and Minnesota Inter-County Association. These organizations have been involved with 404 Assumption for many years now, actively participating as stakeholders in the process. Counties play an important role in implementing the state's Wetland Conservation Act, often serving as the local government unit implementing related permit and mitigation processes. And in addition, and this is my primary role in relationship to the topic, county public work department, works departments are regulated parties that have to obtain permits 
to implement road, bridge, trail, transit, and other projects. And I just have a couple main points to make. And first is that we're really pleased with the work that the Board of Water and Soil Resources and other agencies have done to fulfill the 2021 law that led to preparation of the joint report that um, Les just presented about. Several county representatives participated in the stakeholder meetings last year and the invitation to provide input. So we appreciate that. Um, as Les explained, in addition to record the required cost estimates, the work over the last year really has done a lot to flesh out more detail how the state might best meet the requirements for 404 assumption and overcome some of the potential hurdles. This is a big endeavor and we really appreciate the effort that agencies have invested in it. Uh, second, we su do support the proposed legislation, which would move the process into the final stages of information collection and deliberations necessary to make a fully informed go, no go decision on 404 assumptions. And the counties are very committed to continue to work closely with the state agency staff as the work proceeds, um, including work necessary to quantify associated direct and indirect costs pros and cons benefits to make that decision. Um, and lastly, in particular, the County Engineers Association really supports any efforts, including this, that might ensure state wetland conservation agencies and permitting agencies continue to look for and implement streamlining permitting procedures for transportation projects um, so we can continue to improve the infrastructure that serves Minnesota. So in closing, I thank Senators Eichhorn, Matthews, Bach, and Tomasoni for bringing the legislation forward. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Members, any questions of the testifiers? Seeing none, uh, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to hear this. I think it's important that we uh, streamline our, our permitting process. I think. All of the people that deal with this in the state deserve that and deserve to deal with somebody at the state level instead of the federal government. So I think this is a good good idea and appreciate the opportunity to hear it today. I agree. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll be holding Senate file 3509 over for possible inclusion. Oh, does the DNR wanted to testify? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I missed that. Go ahead. Come on up. I did have that on here too. I'm just... Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Katie Smith. I'm the Director of Ecological and Water Resources at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Um, the DNR appreciates the direction and funding provided in the bill, which are necessary to uh, continue the process, um, gather the information needed to make an informed decision on whether to apply for assumption of the 404 program. Uh, the recently submitted legislative report described DNR's current concerns. Um, DNR identified areas of uncertainty regarding assumptions, such as technical complexities, public engagement needs, tribal interest considerations, and federal coordination, which have limited DNR's ability to provide greater accuracy for some of those funding estimates. The DNR believes that prior to making any recommendations on whether or not to pursue 404 assumption, state agencies would need to collect this additional information. Um, a fiscal note is currently under development for this particular bill. Um, and the DNR would like to make the committee aware that there would be future perpetual costs if the 404 program was assumed and implemented as Mr. Lem outlined. Finally, DNR believes you must check in with federal partners and the tribes, the legislature and the governor's office as part of the decision making on whether to make application. The bill requires application for assumption of the program. The DNR believes it's premature to require that step because of the uncertainties that we've shared, as well as that important decision-making step. DNR will continue to talk to AMC and the author regarding these items. Thank you. Ms. Smith, did you have a handout at all or any, any information at all to what you testified about? Uh, Mr. Chair, we do not. Okay. Um, maybe it would be good to do that if you could do it online and give them your concerns. Uh, um, so, any other questions, members? Thank you. Thanks. Next up is the Senate file 3667, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the opportunity to present Senate file 3667. I'd like to thank my co-sponsors, Senator Coran, Lang, and Dibble, 
And uh, we do have an amendment, Mr. Chair. It's the A4 amendment. Uh, this did have a previous committee stop in transportation. So uh, this amendment, and we will, I'll go over it. It's kind of a delete all. It has similar substance to the underlying bill. Um, go ahead. But we need to, to move it. So if we can move the A4 amendment, Mr. Chair. Senator Eichhorn moves the A4 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Amendment carried. So again, the A4 amendment uh, replaces the underlying bill. It's a delete all, and it just takes care of mostly some cleanup language and a few concerns that were that had arose during the transportation committee hearing. Uh, what it would do is require the Department of Natural Resources uh, to work with uh, the deputy registers and the folks doing the min drive system to see if there is an opportunity where we might be able to get onto that system. It would. Uh, require uh, requests for proposals and a scoring preference, and it would allow a scoring, uh, allow the DNR to give preference to a software vendor that is currently providing registration software to the state. It would require a report within 45 days uh, when after a vendor is selected. It would require the names of all the vendors who submitted proposal, which vendor was selected, an estimate for the timeline, uh, and if preference was given, uh, what the preference was and how they arrived at that number. And if the software vendor that currently provides vehicle registration software, the state submitted a proposal and that vendor was not selected, an explanation of why the vendor was not selected. Uh, this bill came out of a report, um, an independent expert review uh, that was submitted to initially the Transportation Committee. If anybody wants a copy of that report, um, Senate Council can send the link to that so you can see that. Uh, but we believe this will streamline the system. Uh, it will allow the deputy registers to streamline their operations as well. Uh, the, the consumer, the end consumer, won't see the difference. Um, but it will create some synergies, and we certainly don't want to see a situation um, where the DNR is looking to replace their system, which they are looking to do, where we end up in a Minlar situation. Again, I know the legislators around here remember the mess we had there. And by trying to, to plug into a system the state's already paid for, we might be able to save the state a lot of money. So that's why we want to explore this option. And Mr. King, who uh, was kind of the lead on the report, is here and can talk to this as well. Um, and I didn't see Senator Dibble online. Maybe he is on now, but he was part of the uh, discussion in transportation as well and may want to add to this if he's online. So I would bring, if we can bring up Mr. King first. Mr. King, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My name is Rick King. I chaired the independent expert review for the state and uh, also chair the Technology Advisory Council for the state, among other things. I used to be the CIO, CTO at Thomson Reuters before I retired. Anyway, welcome. Uh, glad to have you talking about this today. Um, uh, our independent review uh, made 31 recommendations to the state um, around driver and vehicle services and the use of, of, of the software around deputy registrar and exam stations and so forth. Um, we were asked by the transportation committees in both the House and the Senate to report um, on a couple of those items and we reported and found a few other things along the way. Um, during our visits, which were 20 plus to various deputy registrar sites and locations, as well as doing a 50 state survey of this kind of thing, we found out as we looked at the deputy registrars that they had systems on their uh, counters that were DNR systems right alongside of what they were doing with the DVS system. And we found out that DNR was looking at the replacement of their system for some of the registrations that they do, um, that D uh, deputy registrars do, and um, replacement for things that possibly go beyond what the deputy registrars do as well. So in the report, what we recommended, and I'll read this because it's really important to hear what we say and what we don't say. Um, DVS should engage DNR to review the MinDrive system as a potential solution to replace the DNR system for boat, ATV, and snowmobile registration. So our goal was not to let an opportunity pass where the state has spent multi-millions of dollars to replace uh, auto, 
uh, registration and a driver's licensing system. Not to miss the opportunity if, in fact, the same system can be used for further registrations. We do not recommend any kind of requirement to do so, um, and I'm pleased to report that in conversations with DNR up and down the line, we found uh, good evidence of great dialogue between DVS and DNR, and we can be hopeful that the vendor that um, provides MinDrive would be considered in their um, in their evaluation for replacement of, of their system. So um, just to finalize, our intent was to bring this opportunity for potential synergy to you with an idea toward making sure it doesn't escape unlooked at. So we will be happy as an independent review um, if it's looked at. And I will say that um, Currently, because the state has spent the money on the system of record that includes names, addresses, and that type of information, as well as the IDs that are currently used for many, many, many um, uses and residency location, we're also going to be able to put kiosks out there that can do self-service. That's just the beginning, and there are um, now underway some things that deal with a digital or mobile driver's license in the future. So it's it's a very interesting future, and I know that uh, DNR will give all those things consideration and the types of systems that they look at. That's the end of my testimony, Mr. Chair. I'm glad to answer any questions that anybody might have um, going forward. I think I think we do have a couple of testifiers. We'll go ahead and wait until we're done. Um, hang on, there might be questions. Next, we'll move to... Um, it's up to you. Ray Bowen. ATV Minnesota. A very familiar face. Welcome to the committee. Hey, how are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, my name is Ray Bowen. I'm representing here today the All Train Vehicle Association of Minnesota, as well as the Amateur Riders Snow uh, of Dirt Bikes. Uh, which is Armco District uh, 23. Um, we just became aware of this on, I became aware of it on Friday, that this recommendation was, uh, this legislation was around. <laughs> uh, so I'm, You had that much time, really? I had that much time, yes. And, uh, and worse than that, uh, I have to speak to the old bill because we don't have the amendment. Uh, I don't have the amendment. No, I'm it's, sorry. You're right. We don't. It, it's, it's been it's being right distributed. Right that's that's so my fault. My it's fault it's only here. It's, it's I assumed it was here. It's it's it cleans up the language. Well. Yeah. Does it does it mandate? We just had a little little does error here in getting it. There's, there's no mandate. Okay. Okay. Well, like say I'm playing catch up, so I apologize. Yeah. Well, um, no. But I, um, you know, looking at this, and I did a very brief look at it. Uh, the, you know, this is the. The analysis that appears to be done by the expert committee, and and you know, and maybe that's all that's needed. I mean, I, I don't know, but um, I he's got a copy now anyway. There's been no stakeholder input at all on this. <clears throat> you know, we're we're very protective of our constituency, and we have a lot of issues have had a lot of issues over the years on registration and all that sort of thing. And we like it when, frankly, we can go to DNR and we can get those resolved. Because we have been able to resolve a lot of issues, even though it is, yes, we've spent some money on it. It's an antiquated system. Um, but, you know, uh, we are fearful. Uh, we are fearful of having to deal with some bureaucrats over in DPS that don't even know what a snowmobile and ATV are uh, when it comes to registration. So one of our major concerns is what are we going to have any say, any, I mean, who are we going to be able to talk to? Can we go to the commissioner and DNR and say, hey, we got a real problem with this? Although it must, it sounds like it's the best system since sliced bread, um, in drive, but, you know, we don't know. And so, so what kind of protection are we going to have and who are we going to be able to appeal to or are we going to have to come back to the legislature and have you fix things uh, that may be wrong. 
So control, uh, or at least feeling we have some control over some of the issues and some people that we know that we can talk to and then understand what we're about. Recreational vehicles, boats, and ATVs, and by the way, two of the, the recreational vehicles are missing in this report, the, the, the dirt bikers and the 4x4 trucks. Uh, they probably, they're on the same registration system as with DNR as, as ATVs and so on. So anyway, the, 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 the question, they are not, cars. They are not trucks. So to say that you can easily integrate them into Min Drive, I'm sorry, I'm a little skeptical about that. And, and it may be true. It may be true. But I, haven't, I have not seen the anal analytics that bears that out. So I, I'm sorry for being skeptical. Uh, I've got a whole list of questions about this system, and I assume that we can discuss those if we're part of, the, part of a group, if we can be part of this group that's going to evaluate going into MinDrive. But we do not like the idea of having to come to this committee, come to the Environment Committee, and then do we have to turn around and go to, uh, are we going to have to go to... Uh, DPS, the Public Safety uh, Committee, or are we going to have to go to the Transportation Committee? Well, actually, it will go to State Gov if it's passed out of here, and it also has had a hearing already in Transportation. No, no Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear. In the future, no. if we're made part of this system, mm -hmm. then if, it's, if, if the data is, is under the purview... I might be able to clear up some... Okay. Senator for, and, and from Senator staff, Eichler. and we already knew this as well, the best way to look at this is it's going to be separate but equal. Um, the DNR will still own it. It will be a separate system. They will still work with the DNR. They're not going to have to work with, the, with any other departments. Um, the, only one, the only people that will see the difference is on the back end managing the system. So these folks will still be able to work directly with the DNR. They're not going to have to go through more bureaucracy. Again, the, the, the people on the front end of it, the end consumer, won't know the difference other than the person they talk with at the deputy registrar isn't going to have to switch between systems to do this. So um, concerns are certainly valid but unfounded because it, it, the way this is set up, the DNR will still control, still have control, and so, still so, own the system. So it's fair to say that it's going to streamline the system. Correct. And uh, Mr. Bone, I understand, I understand change is certainly, <laughs> certainly hard. Um, and, and, and I'm... You know, I can't apologize that you weren't involved because I wasn't either. So, um, but now that you have at least a little idea of what's going on here, maybe you can uh, contact the, uh, the the author and he can tell you where and who to work with here uh, with your concerns. And Mr. Yeah. Chair, I'd also recommend that folks work with the DNR as well. The DNR had already started down this path, and it was found out through the independent report that they were starting this process. So, in order to have what we all want is good governance, kind of an extra eye on it based on past experiences with how we've dealt with agencies. So uh, they sure, certainly should reach out to the DNR and try to be a part of that discussion as well. This does not mandate anything, but it makes sure the legislature has an eye on what's happening. And, and, I, and I have discussed this a little bit before the committee meeting that uh, um, the dollars and cents that, that are you know, brought in by the uh, interested parties that uh, Mr. Bone uh, represents is not going to change. That's, that's going to stay the same. Um, well, if I could, so, Mr. Mr. Bowen, go ahead and finish it up, and then we have to, we'll have to move on here. If I could, um, we already work on DNR with this stuff, and we work with them all the time on it, and we have been working with them on its antiquated system. Uh, there are certain elements of this that sound attractive, like the kiosk. We've been asking to do have more mobile type registration flexibility over the years. So, so there are elements of it, but, but I'm just, maybe I'm being overly protective, but, but I, 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 I really get nervous when, it, when we talk about having to do with a couple of other agencies and, and all that, but if in fact those safeguards are, I don't know, are they in the legislation or I don't know where they'll be at, I guess they'll have to be in the agreement between DNR and, and the other agencies. But the main point, 
is because all this is going to be be hashed out presumably when they discuss it is that we want to be part of the hashing yeah. we want to be part we want to yeah. be involved in it I understand um, we also have the DNR here as well I believe someplace uh, are they here or are they online maybe they can make some comments okay thank you mr. chairman thank you uh, mr. Bone Hi, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jenna Covey. I'm a Chief Business Technology Officer with Minnesota IT Services, partnering with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'd like to uh, start with a quick overview of our electronic licensing system known as ELS and an update on our status to modernize the system. Currently, the ELS is a vendor-supplied commercial off-the-shelf COT system that processes hunt and fish related transactions and recreational vehicle transactions. This includes, includes boat, snowmobile, ATV, off-highway -hi vehicle, and off-road vehicle transactions. And starting in the summer of 2022, the ELS system will also support hunter safety, volunteer management registration. The ELS project team has been following the modernization principles laid out in the Minnesota BRC Commission on IT Modernization Playbook since the launch of phase one of this project, which started last year. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. King for his work on the playbook because it really has been instrumental in our approach to this effort. Engaging with our stakeholders has been a critical component of the project to ensure that we're meeting the needs of all of our stakeholders, which uh, is, is many, including hunters, anglers, fish and wildlife staff, enforcement officers, and deputy registrars and license agents. The results of these stakeholder engagement sessions have informed the requirements of our RFP. We've also been working closely with the Department of Public Safety and DVS to ensure that we're aligning our business processes so that uh, common business practices such as scanning of documents can be done with existing equipment and, and uh, conforming to, to business practice. Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot and we'll continue to work closely together. The vision for ELS informed by our stakeholders is to provide a modern integrated system that will meet the needs of all Minnesotans. And I'd like to touch briefly on the components uh, of what the future system will look like. The first major component will be the point of sale system. And this will be used by Minnesotans to buy hunting and fishing licenses and tags online. It will be used by our DNR staff to track and fulfill license sales. And it will be used by deputy registrar and license agent partners to provide recreational vehicle license and registrations. The second major component of the system will be a harvest registration mobile application. This will provide an easier way for hunters and anglers to register animal harvest and access digital documents from their mobile devices. It will also enable a lot more ro robust access to data in real time. And then the final module and component of our future system will be an event management module, which will be a one-stop shop for our hunter safety teachers to provide sa uh, safety class registration information online and for participants to print their registration documents, greatly streamlining that process. Our next step in this phase of the project is to finalize review and publish our request for proposal. We believe it's critical that the full spectrum of our stakeholder needs are considered as we implement a modern ELS. And we uh, will continue to use the principles laid out in the modernization playbook continue to work with TPS and our stakeholders to ensure that we're selecting a tool that best meets our stakeholder needs equally and all of our stakeholder groups together. Uh, there's a clear mandate from Minnesotans and obviously uh, from our passionate groups of stakeholders to modernize our system and provide new digital tools and ways for people to access these, uh, these tools online. And we very much look forward to working with vendors, uh, vendor partners, to see which new innovations are available in the market today, including the vendor that produced the MinDrive system, um, and are looking forward to, to continuing the work on this important project. Thank you for the time today, and I would stand for any questions. Members, any questions? Hmm? Senator Torres Ray, I'm sorry, I missed your hand. Senator Torres Ray. Uh, 
sorry, Chair, uh, I, I had a question uh, earlier about the amendment, but I don't want to have a I forgot to put my hand up. I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question I have, uh, and I think that's it for testifiers, isn't it? I don't have any other yeah, testifiers, okay. Mr. Chair. Um, that I have with the uh, uh, Ms. Covey is we, we see ATV, we see, you know, all the, uh, the, the groups that we're talking about, ARMCA, ATV, men, uh, here all the time. I mean, we see them all. They're in this committee a lot. And I know they do work with the DNR and have worked with them for many years, years before I even showed up here. And I'm just wondering, is there any reason why you wouldn't do that? Or if you, and, and if you haven't, can you, uh, as this bill continues to move forward, can you uh, be working with them as well, uh, as well as the hunting and fishing folks? Uh, because they're, they're gonna be a huge part of this, this uh, system if it should, should go through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we've been working with uh, many of our stakeholder groups in a variety of ways, including doing uh, outreach through a digital engagement survey process, as well as doing follow-up uh, stakeholder um, listening sessions with different groups. We've been meeting with our uh, game and fish oversight committees to discuss the process that we've been moving forward with. And we know that it doesn't stop with the RFP. We actually plan to include stakeholders in the RFP intent to negotiate process. So they'll have an, an opportunity to be hands-on um, part of that process and then throughout the full life cycle of the project. So as we actually begin implementation um, communication, we know that modernization is gonna create change for a lot of people in the way that we do our process. And we think um, that was one of the big lessons learned from some of our previous projects is the huge importance of working together with all of our stakeholders for the full um, duration of the project. So we definitely will continue to work closely. Please do that, and, and I do see uh Mr. Meyer, who, who's also a very familiar face here and is very familiar with the, uh, with, the with the groups, uh, uh, can remind you as to how to get a hold of them, I guess, or whatever. And, and uh, I think that you know we can we can ass be assured that that's going to happen moving forward. Being they're very a very big part of the process here. So, members, any other questions? Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for mentioning that. I would also request that the DNR reach out to the ATV groups and include them. It sounds like they are working with some groups, but uh, would appreciate if the ATV folks were at it, so thank you for that. Um, I think this is good governance. Um, it, it keeps the legislature's eye on what's going on, and, and we should be informed of, of these things because it matters to, to our entire state. So thank you again for the opportunity to hear uh, Senate File 3667 is amended, and I would move that Senate File 3667 as amended uh, pass the committee and be moved to the State Government Committee. Member Senator Eichhorn moves that Senate File 3667 as amended to pass and go to State Government. But, uh, Senate State Government, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. The, amend the bill and the amendment passes. Next up we have Senator Senjum. I wanted to call him Johnny Appleseed, but I, I shouldn't do that in public, I suppose. Actually, you know what? He gave himself that name earlier today, <laughs> to be clear. So he has now acquired a new, uh, a new nickname in the, uh, in the hallways of, in the hallways of uh, justice here. Senator Senjum. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I understand we have about uh, 10 minutes left, if that, and so we're going to make this fast. Uh, and uh, I've been around long enough, I think, to know how to do this. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Senate File, what is it? Uh, Senate File... Uh, 3653. 3653. It's, it's, it's all about trees. It's all about uh, literally, uh, you know, perhaps up to 5 million new trees in Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Chair, it, uh, as you retire, I would view this as your legacy bill. Uh, as you drive around the countryside after you retire and look out into the hinterlands and see those trees, you will know that if you do this, you will have some identity with those trees. So uh, we all know about trees. We love trees. Uh, certainly as we think about trees in the area of, uh, in, in a time of a uh, lot of discussion about climate change, they're certainly a reservoir of carbon. Uh, they shade our lawns. They shade our houses. They uh, uh, 
can, uh, and, and we're in, frankly, desperate need of uh, new trees given the emerald ash, ash borer issue in Minnesota. Uh, there's proposals within this bill to uh, use them as uh, highway, if you will, snow fences and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and just to all, all around in terms of uh, making, better, making Minnesota a better place, uh, a more tree oriented space. And I was, I was thinking I was coming down the elevator today, and I'm from rural Minnesota, if you didn't know that, not necessarily Rochester. Well, that's where I live now uh, and for many years. But uh, if, I, if I drive out to my childhood countryside, I, I see a lot of places that used to be trees as I was a young child that, that aren't trees anymore. And uh, so this bill uh, would make Minnesota, I think, the tree state USA. And Mr. Chair, I've got some witnesses here, but in the essence of time... Uh, well, I think we should have somebody come up and testify. We can have somebody fine. come up and testify. Sure. We've got uh, certainly the Board of Soil and Water Conservation person here, uh, Mr. Jasky, and a couple of others. Uh, well, I have I have the city of Rochester. I don't know if you have them them on the. Uh, we can we can certainly do that. Jeff, I, I would uh, really Hammerman. appreciate a dialogue on this, as opposed yeah. to a lot of, you know, we all love trees. We don't probably have to be convinced of, of their value, but you know, uh, with respect to this bill, I'd, I'd I'd certainly like some committee dialogue on it. Do you have? Go ahead. Uh, do we have an amendment to? Oh, I'm sorry. I do have an A1 amendment, to, Mr. Chair. If we could consider that. Okay, Senator Rood offers the A1 amendment. And Mr. All Chair, that's simply added shoreline, uh, shoreline uh, stabilization. As we travel in bonding and so on and so forth, uh, we see river after river that are getting washed out. And that's I right. think if we're going to do trees, uh, why not consider shoreline in the process? Okay. That's all this is. To the A1 amendment, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. The amendment passes. Senator, do you have any idea what kind of dollars you're talking about here? I see the appropriations are empty. Uh, they, they are empty. This is a this is a totally scalable bill, and uh, you know if it uh, does make it uh, into a possible inclusion, we will certainly work that out. Okay. Do we have the anybody here from the Northwest Regional Sustainable Development Partnership? They're I'm online. Here and I'm from the northeast. Oh, I'm sorry, northeast. <laughs> I come from the northwest. Maybe I was a little, little confused there. Not a lot of trees up in that very far northwest. I know that. But go ahead real quickly, if you would. Yep. Uh, I'll do this really quick. And I did put together a couple slides. I'll have three minutes. And I just changed the name of my slide to the tree belt. Yeah, just um, identify yourself, please, for the record. Yep. David Abaz, Executive Director of Northeast RSDP, uh, University of Minnesota Extension. And I just wanted to uh, address uh, some of the challenges and the research uh, work that we're doing that will uh, lean into kind of these efforts. As we know, the, the forests are, are looking a little ragged. Uh, this, is a shore, this is a North Shore view, and we're working with researchers on identifying the best way and the best approach of reforesting uh, some of our areas that have been hit hard. As we know, the ash borer, the spruce budworm, soil erosion, uh, all of these are, are challenges. Uh, and needs with trees. And this legislation will really work to build a resilient forest and our communities that uh, enjoy them and rely on them. So reforesting marginal lands, filling in holes in our forests, cleaner water, soil and carbon building capacity, road safety with the living tree fences as was mentioned. And then a whole economic aspect of the private nurseries and farmers growers network. And I just wanted to introduce you to uh, the project called the forest assisted migration project that really supports this legislation as uh, we attempt to bring some of those dollars that are being used uh, to buy trees from out of state and out of country. Uh, a lot of our trees are bought from Canada. Uh, we're building through the research seed collecting network and uh, farmers uh, and uh, retailers who want to be growing these seedlings for the various uh, places. What's great about this bill is that it's really focused on private landowners, and uh, that's a real need that we're hoping we can also fill. So I just wanted to add my uh, support to this bill and uh, encourage its passage. Very good. Thank you. Members, any questions of the testifier? And members, in your packets, you do also have other support uh, groups, uh, Rochester Parks and Recreation uh, for your 
perusing here, as well as uh, uh, the Nature Conservancy. I'm assuming they're both, without looking real in depth, them that they both uh, support the bill, Senator. So, um, Mr. Haberman, real quickly, if you'd like to say a few words, uh, go ahead and identify yourself and and uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, and I'll keep this very brief. Um, I just basically wanted to uh, say that City of Rochester supports the bill's goals, uh, appreciates Senator Sengen's work and your work in bringing this forward. Um, <clears throat> all the information I wanted to share um, on how this bill will help cities like Rochester all over the state are in my comments that are posted online sure. and I believe are in your packets. So Thank you very I'll much. I'll just leave it at that. Thank, Thank you, you very much, very much. Uh, members, any other questions? Any, anybody from the audience that would li like to testify? Uh, against trees or anything? Uh, <laughs> so these trees now, they're going to grow in Rochester. I guess uh, we've got to have a place for those crows to roost, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> we've talked about the crow yeah, situation right. in Rochester as well as the geese. So, um, Senate files. So, Mr. Chair, can I just... Uh, yeah, I please, can't, final I can't resist yes. this. I yep. can't resist this. You know, you know, back in grade school, we were all forced to learn this yep. little poem about trees. Uh, and I'll just say the first uh, first line and the last line, but I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. Poems are made uh, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. So as you consider this bill going forward, uh, think about this poem. Uh, think about your legacy, Mr. Chair. You can be and tree God's man, work, USA. And God's work, I might add. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And uh, so, appreciate your consideration. Sure. Today. Senate file 3653 as amended will be... Uh, laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Thank Senator. Thank you very much. Members, that concludes the uh, business for today, uh, so we stand adjourned. <laughs>